and the past has been a huge influence on late 80s and 90s youth culture with her stores in Portobello Market, Camden Market and her shop Sign of the Times in Kensington Market. So hello Fiona. Hello. hello. So, so what was it like to be part of such an amazing two eras, the 80s and the 90s? Um, well, I mean, we were just part of the crowd and just, just doing, you know, what, I don't know, it, it didn't... At the time, it just felt normal. I mean, you know, probably like it does for you now in in your life. But I mean, looking back, obviously, you realise what a really significant time it was. Um, I was always into underground culture. That was my thing. And um, underground culture was quite separate from normal culture in those days because you didn't have the internet. And so you had to find out about things. Yeah. And I'd always been into clubs. I'd been into punk when I was very young. And for me, the link between fashion and music was completely, uh, uh, you know, inseparable for me. I, um, so I was always into things that had... Um, a scene I suppose um, like punk and then like the dirt box scene and the mug club scene and all the sort of other scenes that happened during the 80s that were initially influenced by music but then had an impact on fashion okay so is that what drew you to wanting to own your own stall and shop just because you were so into the music and the fashion or was it something else that drew you to it um, no I was I was just m passionate about the sort of club scene really and um, that morphed into various different um, stages and, and styles as the music changed really um, and I just wanted to stay you know working in an area that was to do with that rather than getting a straight job as yeah. jobs were very straight in those days you know offices weren't funky jobs were quite um <laughs> <laughs> and um so for me i just wanted to work in an area that i enjoyed really yeah rather than doing something just because it's a job and you're down money you wanted to be involved in what you're interested exactly, in exactly yeah so was you always determined to own your own clothing shop or so when you said you wanted to be with the scene is it definitely you wanted to be in clothing or you just sort of you knew you wanted to be that scene and you sort of ended up being part of it and that's the clothing part was what you ended up doing? Uh, well initially when I got into punk I was very young, I was only 15 and so I'm obviously a fan you know and going to the clubs and going to the gigs and we all used to either customise our own clothes or sort of make our own clothes, that's how it was in those days um, and then when I got a bit older I Portobello Market was huge in those yeah. days and it, it was a proper destination for uh, vintage clothing and well mainly vintage clothing actually which was incredible because if you imagine at the end of the 70s the sort of stuff that was being sold then you know but you know, incredible vintage that you know would cost a fortune now was yeah. Was no, well, that's what people nowadays they want all the vintage clothes from back then. So exactly. It's, like it's sort of so it's all resurged back again, hasn't it? Resurged back yeah. again, yeah. It's all those sort of trends have. So I just wanted to get a job at Portobello. So I worked for this lady called Ronnie who had a shop called Radar that was quite you know well known on the scene in Portobello Road, and she had the most incredible vintage in there. So I got a job with her running her stall at Portobello and then later working in her shop and that's how I learned about fashion because I didn't go to fashion college. So you you started working for someone else so how did you go about setting up your own stall and then going from having your own stall to your own shop? Well back in those days no one even had a CV. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whereas now you have to have one now. Then, I mean you literally go in a shop and say do you have any jobs and if you look right and your face fitted yeah. you get a job I mean that's what it was like and it was much easier to employ people I think like that and also the scene was much smaller I mean it was not everyone you know we were not like every you know everybody else there was a small section of people who were into alternative culture and you know vintage and all these things and most people were you know in the mainstream whereas now everybody wants to do these jobs you know yeah. uh, whereas there wasn't that sort of demand before it's quite a small scene um, so I learned about vintage from her um, and then I would go and work in nightclubs as, as well because in order to earn enough money to pay your own rent you had to do quite a lot of jobs, yeah. uh, probably like now. And I worked at Gossip's Nightclub for Gaz, Gaz's Rock and Blues. Okay, so did you enjoy being part of the music thing? Oh, I loved it. I yeah. mean, because I, in, when, with my wages, if there was anything left after paying the rent, um, I, would go to I was going to clubs this whole way through and um, really into the music and the music obviously gone from punk and then I went on the rocking scene when sort of punk got too commercialised and that was all like rockabilly and rhythm and blues and then I worked to work for Gaz who was playing rockabilly rhythm and blues and also Scar 
um, yeah. and all the big, you know, Scar legends would come down to gossips like Desmond Decker, Prince Buster. Uh, I met BB King. Oh really? Uh, yeah. Oh, that's that's David Bowie and Mick Jagger would come down. I mean, it was pretty crazy. Uh, but you know, it, it was very low key. You know, th it wasn't this celebrity culture that's happening yeah, now. Yeah. Whereas so to us nowadays, I mean, when you say Bowie and Mick Jagger, I'm like, oh my god, that's amazing. But you were saying to me earlier, like back then, they weren't as maybe as big no, as they, 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 they are they now. Was, no, they were huge stars. They were huge stars, and when they played, they played to thousands of people. It wasn't they play Wembley or whatever. But the thing is, is that people didn't react in the same way okay, that people yeah. do now. I mean, obviously, we were desperately impressed when they yeah. came out to the club. But everyone acted very cool. cool yeah, right. Everyone pretended they hadn't seen them. You know, yeah. it was all very normal. Uh, but Gaz's father was in John Mayles, uh, Mayles Blues Brothers, who were very significant in the sixties. Okay, yeah. Um, and they were. You he was part of the um, scene that brought over blues from America. So a lot of celebrities, as you would call them now, came to gossips, um, and especially music people. Um, so it was, it was an incredible energy down there. I think there was only, it only held them like 200 people. It was very, very small. Yeah. Um, Which is probably what made it quite nice and intimate. Intimate, yeah. 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 In, and, and the other thing is, is that... Um, it had a reggae club on Saturday, which was David Brodigan's oh, night, yeah. So he also had all the big reggae stars coming over from Jamaica uh, to that club. And um, so I heard a lot of people, uh, you know, on that night too, you know, in a tiny, you know, atmosphere, you know. Um, so you learned a lot about music hanging out in those places. Those places. Because yeah. um, you were saying earlier that you had your shop, but you also did club nights. Do you think the reason you did the club nights is because at the beginning that's how you sort of kept well for me it was just normal I mean uh, by the time I did the shop I was 27 and I've been on the club scene since I was 15 mm -hmm. and like I say for me the whole th the thing there wasn't a difference you know clubs and and music and it was all one sort of you know whole thing and so I didn't see the separation yeah. um, I wasn't in high fashion where really it is only just about fashion and for me like I say the excitement was you know like when hip-hop first started in America you know I, I someone was sending me these tapes from from the Bronx which were for, from Africa Islam and he was playing you know like Grandmaster Flash and all of this stuff which was brand new I mean completely brand new and very very underground and from that all this fashion emanated you know like the gold chains and you know yeah. sort of all the hip hop clothing, the trainers and all the rest of it, and for me, so much hand in hand, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it, it came together, and it, it it was like a whole new trend coming over. And once you got into the music, you wanted to be into the fashion. You know, it was. Um, you know, and it was like an organic thing. It wasn't something you were told from a fashion magazine. It sort of just spread like wildfire. You know, the yeah. music would be played, then suddenly everyone would want the T-shirt. Yeah, know? exactly. Do you think that's why you you did so well with your shop because you weren't just into the clothes. You had this whole background. You knew about the music. You knew about the new stuff that was I, coming I suppose out. so. I mean, like I say, in the world I was in, that was quite normal. I mean, in Kenston Market, where I set up my first shop after having done stalls at pa Camden and Portobello for years everyone in Kenston Market was like that everybody um, who had a stall in Kenston Market we all had different um, styles but everyone was influenced by fashion and music um, street fashion I suppose you call it yeah. now and um, that's the whole atmosphere was about that you 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 know the people who were in high fashion were almost in a separate world really from us yeah. um, and we all hung out together and the whole thing was about you know the, the new trends that were coming in, some from America, some organically grown here. And it was all about being different and being different from the mainstream. Um, none of us would shop in high street shops. That was like anathema. Um, it was all independent businesses, which to this day I still are very passionate about. Yeah, you were saying earlier. So how did you go about setting up your business, going from, say, working from someone to setting up your own shop? How did you do that? Did you... Find, did someone help you out money-wise? Because I know a lot no, of people I mean, would love to do it themselves, even nowadays. Well, basically, I was still working for other people. I was working for Ronnie, um, and then she decided to shut the shop, and she moved out of London. And all the people that actually worked for her set up their own little things. But we didn't really see it as setting up a business in those days. Business information was really hard to come by. Yeah. I mean, there wasn't obviously the internet, and there wasn't any books really on how to set up a business or any help or anything, advice or anything. And, and so we just saw it as, oh, we'll do a stall 
you know, do her own stall on Saturday. So that's really how it started at Portobello. Um, you had to queue up at five in the morning in every time to you get had a stall. To be very dedicated. Yeah, you had to be very dedicated. But you know, it's what I wanted to do with my life. You yeah. know, and I didn't see my life, and I don't think a lot of people did in those days, is in terms of a career, because that's the other thing. Careers weren't thought of like that. I mean, whereas nowadays you're, you know, with uni, you're like, you're made to think, what do I want to do next? What I want to do next? Whereas it seems like you sort of just was enjoying fell into things. No, yeah, people just fell into it. things in the 80s. You know, uh, the other thing is that people settled down very young then. I mean, most people were married by 25 with kids, and so for you not to do that was actually quite unusual. Uh, but of course, on the sort of scene we were, there were a lot of people who maybe weren't very conventional anyway. Yeah. Uh, so started off doing stores, and then the store sort of grew you know just organically um, and then I got a permanent store which meant I didn't have to get up at five, be there be there at five not even get up be there yeah. at five so you have to get up at three or four actually. yeah that's true I dedication was, I don't know why markets run like that apparently it's some traditional thing it's crazy because yeah. no one used to come shopping until yeah. 10 or 11 yeah, so you're hanging yeah. around yeah. 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 It's, it's, it, and it's still like that in a lot of markets it's very strange um, but anyway, so that sort of grew and then, um, you know, various trends would come and go. I used to go to New York to buy the hip-hop bling, jewellery to sell at Camden and Portobello. But again, it was only a very small market. It, you, you'd make a living and not much more. I mean, you didn't really see it as a business. It was more like how you paid your rent and, okay, you know, use yeah. the money to go out and stuff. Um, and maybe have a trip away and stuff. So, um, but for me, it really kicked off. I, I did a few sensible jobs. I did actually yeah, try that them. Yeah, the stalls? With the stalls, yeah. yeah. I, I worked for Costumiers, which was Burns and Nathans, which turned into Angels uh, Costumiers, okay. which did film costume. And I briefly worked for the BBC, but the BBC was deathly boring in those days. <laughs> <laughs> before it was reorganised, and it, the, my job was just so mind-numbing, I, I just uh, couldn't handle it, so I well, went back to the market. Working at Portobello Market, you know, that whole atmosphere, even now when you go down there, there's like, you just want to be there, don't you? As an so something yeah. like maybe It was very, you, but, definitely yeah. dull. I mean, really was, and, and the, the uh, you know, the... Um, the, to get promoted, I was told I'd have to wait like seven years till I get the job I wanted. <laughs> and I just couldn't <laughs> laugh. <laughs> really yeah. laugh yeah. So I uh, went back to the markets um, and then Acid House came along and a friend of mine, Billy Boy, who collects couture uh, for a living, who's very famous in that world, um, he, I was working for him, assisting him when he came to London and through him I met a lot of the top designers at the time. You know, Galliano and, and people like that. And um, he was doing a Scaparelli exhibition at the VA. I, I just assisted him with that. And so I learned a lot about high fashion. And he also had this cachet of uh, original 70s smiley badges. He asked me just to sell on my stall. And I sold them on the stall, and suddenly, at the beginning, I don't know whether it was the end of 87 or the beginning of 88, but anyway, around that time, suddenly, all these kids were coming in from outside London, or central London anyway, and they were wearing very baggy t-shirts and sweatpants, which was very different from what um, you know the trendy kids in London were wearing, because they were yeah. very much into high fashion at that point. Yeah. It was like you know the height of the boom at 88, and they were just mad for these badges, and I, I was you know very perplexed, couldn't understand why. <laughs> and. Um, my friend told me it's because, you know, this acid house thing had started. So you sort of gra grasped on to that trend? Well, I, I'd, I'd been going to places like the Wag Club and those sort of, sort of West End clubs that were big at the time. And, yeah, I, you know, most of the people in those clubs did not get this new trend because it was coming from the suburbs of South London mainly. And... Um, so, you know, we were like, what's going on? And, and, and the people buying the badges were, were much younger than us. I was 27. These, these, they were in their sort of late teens. Okay. But um, a friend of mine who had been going to the cl these clubs uh, said, you know, really should go and check them out and see what they're like. And I was a bit like, you know, I've seen it, done it, you know. Yeah. And, you know so, you know, not, don't really want to start a whole new clubbing life again. But anyway, I got dragged down to this club, and it was Shum that was in... Um, Southwark at the time at the fitness centre and I walked in and the smoke machines were going and you could hardly see in front of your face and this crazy sort of you know acid beat was happening and stuff and it was like wow this is amazing, amazing. Yeah. and because I think I although I was very young when I was into punk I was only 15 you know I realised that this was a big change you know what I mean that this was a significant shift 
going on and it was just so exciting that you just wanted to be part of it and so there they. <laughs> yeah, so you said you sold. You said you sold badges. What else did you did you sell as well? Was well, just, after I started to go to Shum, it was such an incredible atmosphere that people, you know, because there were no clothes for that scene at that point because it was so early. People were making stuff. People were making T-shirts. People were making various different things to go with the scene. And so I said I'd sell them on my store for people. Okay. So you did you make some stuff yourself, or was it more you other people made it and then you sold it in your shop? Um, I started to make these jackets uh, from the Turkish carpets. That um, what inspired that? Uh, That's really interesting. And, well, I, I was already supplying a, a stall in um, Kensington Market called Big Jesus Trash Can. Um, well, actually, they'd been called Marks and Stalin before, and I was selling them Russian badges and then they morphed into Big Jesus Trash Can which was all about the influence of sort of spirituality and sort of you know various moods that were going on at the time and they'd also got into Acid House as well and they wanted some clothing and they were doing some really brilliant t-shirts already and I said that I'd you know make these jackets for them and basically I'd seen the, the carpets were on a stall down at Portobello yeah. um, where the guy was literally selling them to for people to put on their wall as like religious icons. Okay. And also I'd seen them in New York, much more actually than in London. And over there they had like Martin Luther King carpets and Elvis carpets yes. and all sorts of things. So it was all about icons really. That was what that and, and I didn't call it a collection, I just made these jackets. So you, know. you got the carpet and you sewed it onto, was it? I cut them out and I sewed them onto vintage denim jackets. Okay. Yeah. Which that's I was, really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> that's really interesting because a lot of it people... Customisation, basically. That's yeah. come back in though, hasn't it, yeah. recently? Yeah, so yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. to think about putting the carpet on the jacket, you wouldn't even think about... No, well, I, th I think that there was a big really trend mad. for customisation around that time. There was a club called Delirium, uh, which was pre-house, although they were playing house records there, but it didn't have that atmosphere of the acid house uh, clubs. And people were customising their MA1 jackets there. They yeah. were pinning all the badges on. Yeah. And, and at the V&A, they had yeah. all the jean jackets with all the customisations on. Yeah. So I can imagine what it looked like. Yeah, so um, but it was in the air. It was in the air. <laughs> so, what are the pros and cons to running a stall and a, a store? Like, what? Uh, well, well, the, the, the store was really simple. Really, you just had to have the stock, which was either yours or you know you bought from other people, and um, you just set it up. Up. I mean, you know, the hours are long, and uh, you know, standing outside isn't always a lot of fun. In England, England. you've got to really want to be there. Yeah, you? I mean, I personally, I just love the buzz of the market. I love the people that I met down there. I like the whole interaction of selling, you know. Yeah. And in those days, if you wanted something different, you did have to go to the markets. Now you can find something different everywhere. But you had to make a special effort. So, you know, it was like a destination shopping experience. I can imagine. I mean, yeah. Port Vale Market now is still a destination, but I mean, back then it was probably even more amazing. It was much more, I think, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Um, I know a lot of celebs came into your store. Can you name some of your favourite visitors? Oh, well, this was later on. In, uh, in Kensington Market, we had so many bands and pop stars, and no one blinked an eye, because uh, the record companies, I didn't even know this until quite recently, the record companies were up the road, and they would give the artists money, often cash, when they signed a record deal to go and buy clothes, because in okay. those days um, there weren't many stylists. St there were a few stylists, but they were quite rare, and they mainly did the pop bands. But if you were a credible band, you'd just get money when you signed an album deal or whatever, a single deal, and then you'd go to Kensington Market and buy your own clothes. Well, so now they get everything for free, don't they? No, <laughs> yeah, they would actually buy their own yeah. clothes. Like that. So we had everyone. I mean, we had everyone from Axel Rose to Courtney Love to, you know, oh, yeah, oh you, you name it, Bjork, yeah, who yeah. later on opened my shop in Covent Garden for, for us, you know. Um, so many. I mean, every day there'd be a pop star coming around. Princess Diana, you see you and go around hyper, hyper. Yeah, but it was crazy. That's, I mean, that's a bit weird to think of Do Princess Diana. Well, she only lived down the road in Kirsten Palace, you see. So yeah, so she'd come yeah, in. Yeah, Cher used to come in. I mean, it, it, it was, you name it, that every pop star at that time would have been in Kent Market at some point. So I know you had some pieces in Vogue magazine, and this was due to people such as Isabella Blow, who I know you became quite good friends with. 
Yes, so that was quite an amazing story. Um, basically, I opened a hyper hyper shop because uh, we found that people um, in the recession had less and less money to spend. The younger people who went to Kenston Market, we wanted to sell, you know, more uh, upmarket young designer clothes. So I opened a unit there, and um, she came in one day. I wasn't actually there the day she came in. But she came in with Kate Moss. Uh, Bruce Weber and Stephen Mizell. That's amazing. Um, and she was taking them on a tour of London of you know places she thought were great. So she came into the shop and she wanted to borrow clothes for a shoot she was doing for Vogue, which was the centre of Vogue Christmas issue, which is um, probably the most prestigious bit of Vogue you can get. Yeah. But because it was for Stephen Mizell, you see that that was the whole thing, and it was very much about the young London, the explosion of talent that was going on. So she took some clothes from the shop and uh, put them in Vogue. I mean, the funny thing is, so this is hard to imagine now, but the sort of people who read Vogue in those days didn't buy the clothes, so we didn't actually sell very much of yeah, what which is what there. people yeah. nowadays, if you're in Vogue, everyone wants to buy it. Exactly, they? exactly. But for us, it was more like a recognition that what we were doing was important. Um, and she very much felt that. And she was really connected to young London at the time. She wasn't well known herself at the time, but she, she was very sort of aware of what was going on. And she knew Alexander McQueen, and um, I went to uh, with her to his early shows. And I went, I'm not sure whether it was first or second show, maybe second show, I went to the Bluebird Garage in the King's Road, and there were probably only about 100 or 70 of us there, something like that. Um, and that was the show where she was paid buying the collection, and I actually went to her with a cash point, to the cash point to draw out money yeah, to pay him. Because I went to Isabella Blow Exhibition, and didn't she buy like, the whole collection and she had to pay him back in installments yeah, because yeah, she, yeah. Could yeah. Actually she, she didn't it have much her. money I mean she came from a wealthy background but she didn't actually have much physical cash at the time I don't think she got paid very much at Vogue um, and she was a real dynamo she was very eccentric I mean she was like almost from another era she was yeah. that sort of aristocratic sort of figure that you don't really get anymore and she was quite unworldly in lots of ways quite dreamy but she had a lot of energy and a lot of vision um, and she certainly saw potential in McQueen that maybe he didn't even see himself I mean she really I felt gave him vision and when you see that exhibition at Somerset House that was on recently I think you can really see her influence yeah, she, in his career. She recognised people before they came because she was a part of making them yeah, who absolutely, they are today. Absolutely, so for yeah. her, I know you might not think it a big thing, but for her to recognise maybe your shop and put you in vote, that must be quite sort of a... It was amazing. Yeah. I mean, like, like I said, at the time, it didn't mean what it does now because we didn't get... We got more business from being in vogue, but not in the way you would now because, like I say, it was more like a style thing, you know? It yeah. was more like a visual imagery thing than actually about sales. But it, it was very it was very nice and she was fun to be with, yeah. Oh, I, bet I'm, <laughs> I bet a lot of people will be jealous about that. <laughs> Um, um, so, have you got any words of wisdom for some of our subscribers who might be thinking about setting up their own shop or stall? Well, I think I think the best thing, if you can, is to work for other people first because you learn a lot from working from other people. You learn from them, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and you, you you learn you know about the industry. But it, I realise in this climate that might not be possible. So, what I would say to you is just research as much as you can. Uh, try and find an area to go into that is maybe slightly less competitive than ever everything else. Um, the great advantage you have, which you don't realise when you're young, is the fact you're young because everyone wants the young market and young people tend to spend more of their disposable income than older people yeah. on, on fashion. So you, you're sort of, by just by being young, you're aware of what people want, which is a massive advantage already on someone older. So you need to tap into that and find out a way you can monetize it is yeah. the word now this is a new word for us um and and just go for it i think with digital media and uh, social networking the opportunities are amazing and i've seen people with very small labels who've absolutely worked it and managed to get quite big brands from yeah, that it's impressive isn't yeah. it um and our final question is what's your one piece of advice to people who are going to the fashion industry as a general what's important i think you've it's very, very competitive now. I know that. The industry's changed massively in the time that I was doing it. You've just got to want to do it really badly. I think it's like anything else, um, especially if you're in a competitive area. You've got to really want it, and that means working late, work, doing whatever it takes to get there. Um, I, or the only word of caution I would say is be sure 
you want what you're going for because yeah. you know you might work that hard and actually end up thinking oh my god I've done the wrong it's not actually what I want to do uh, but if you if you roughly know what you want to do go in that direction and just work it you know and and you know I've seen people some out incredible odds to become successful you know it, it is possible you've got to really strive for it yeah you've, you've got yeah. to want it I think I think anything that's um, not easily um, achieved you have to really go for it music business you know media um, fashion you've got to just go hell for leather just go for it that's <laughs> good words of wisdom thank you very much for letting me interview no you thank, thank you, you.